On today's show, we're going to take a little time for some personal reflection as we build this simple, elegant mirror. Hit it. The design of our mirror frame is pretty straightforward, but let me show you a couple of details I really like. First off, the side piece. It goes all the way to the top, and we've got that nice graceful curve in the top rail, but it continues right on through that side piece, through the end grain, and gives it a nice smooth, continuous look. If you look between each piece, you'll see there's a little V-groove there. Now that V-groove is just an optional detail. If you don't like it, you don't have to put it there. But I think it gives the piece a little bit more visual interest. It makes each individual part of the frame pop a little bit more. And we're going to do a finishing process later with a glaze that's going to enhance that even more. Uh, the other thing is we've got half lap joints here. This particular design I think really calls for half laps. You could certainly do a mortise and tenon joint if you wanted to, but half laps are pretty darn easy and they're very strong. Certainly adequate for a frame like this. Uh, the wood itself here is a figured maple. We're going to do a staining process on it and normally I don't stain my projects, especially for ones that are made from really expensive wood. But this is going into my bathroom and it has to match the cabinets or at least come close to matching the cabinets that are already there. So stain it is. We've got a nice lacquer finish. I'll show you how I apply that. Uh, and at this point, we need to kind of go back in time a little bit, jump into the bathroom and see if we can't figure out the proper measurements using the wall itself in the space so we know exactly what we're doing with the project parts. All right, so let's head to the bathroom. Never thought I'd say that on the show. So welcome to the Spagnolo bathroom, and this is the wall where the mirror needs to go. Now previously, the mirror that was there was one of those frameless mirrors, and it kind of spanned from wall to wall. So what we want to do now is make it a little bit more elegant by providing a nice wooden frame that fits the space fairly well. So the way I'm going to do this is using blue tape and a tape measure to sort of mark the locations, get the overall size, and figure out what the size of my parts will be. All right, and blue tape is nice because you can put it on the wall and rip it right off and not affect the paint. I'm going to try and keep in mind the center line here and make sure that everything is equally distant from that center point. But I'm just going to start putting pieces of tape in to represent what I think looks pretty good. So as you can see, there's a lot of back and forth there. And yes, we're wasting some tape, but it's certainly cheaper than wasting wood. So as the layout is on the wall, I can kind of get a feel for if I'm hitting my target or not. I really just want something that's nicely balanced between the lights at the top and the top of the surface down here. And I think I've hit that. So we can use what we have here to take measurements. And if we're close to a whole number, let's just use the whole number. We have some wiggle room here. So my bottom here, if I take a look at that, it's about four inches, a little less than four, and the side is three. And I'll tell you what, even though that's at four, I think I'd be perfectly happy making that three so that it's consistent. And the bottom will be three inches wide and the side will be three inches wide. Now at the top, remember, we've got this peak for the curve there. So I'm thinking maybe at its tallest point, it would be four inches. And as it tapers down and kind of curves down, we can bring it down to three inches. And whatever that curve happens to be to connect those lines is whatever it is. Now for the actual mirror dimensions, we'll just take a measurement and see how close we are to a round number. I've got about 26 there, which is pretty good. And here I've got about 30, 34 to the peak. So we'll just write all these numbers down and now we can head into the shop and actually start to draw this out in a full size drawing. Well, all I need now is my trusty drywall square, a pencil and a piece of quarter inch plywood to do the drawing on. So I'm really pleased with the way that this looks. It's got a nice simple elegance to it. Uh, the proportions look good to my eye and I think it's gonna look really nice in the bathroom. Now, speaking of proportions, a lot of times when you design a piece like this, you should be thinking about either whole number proportions or the golden ratio, if you've heard of that, to help you decide on your relative lengths. In this case, I'm kind of abandoning that because I want this to fit in a very specific location for a very specific purpose. So if I don't have some theoretical standard achieved with this piece, I don't really care. I just want to make sure it's wide enough and tall enough to look good in the space that it's going in. So in this case, functionality for me sort of trumps a traditional theoretical design number. All right, the other thing we should probably think about now, which you might think is a little early to talk about, and that's the mirror, right? We need to know what size the mirror should be cut to. Now, if you cut this stuff yourself, 
good on you. I don't really mess with glass too much, so I'm gonna have a local place cut it for me. I'm going with quarter inch thick glass, so it's uh, not really gonna warp or distort or anything. And we wanna cut it an inch wider and taller than the dimensions of this interior space, because we're gonna cut a nice rabbit around the perimeter, and that's gonna give us the size that we need. So for me, that's 31 and a quarter tall and 27 wide. So I just called a local glass company and said, hey, here's the measurements. And the key is I wanna make sure I have that glass in the shop before I finalize this internal cut on the frame. So we've got a little work to do before we get to that point, and it's a good time to place that order. Now, if you've ever done a project with half laps, you know that it's a real pain in the butt to glue those things together, but we can make some choices now that will actually make the glue up a whole lot easier. So cut your parts a 16th of an inch wider than the plans call for, and you'll see why a little bit later when it comes time for clamping. All right, so let's start rough cutting some wood. I like to use the bandsaw for ripping rough stock. It's much safer than the table saw, and I'm not worried about the cut quality at this point. The chop saw is an excellent tool for rough cutting to length. Now everything is milled to final dimension according to the plans. With regard to thickness, the plans call for 3 quarters of an inch, but if you can keep your stock thicker, go for it. Heavily figured maple is prone to tear out, but the segmented head in the planer really does a nice job. Remember to cut these pieces a sixteenth of an inch oversize, so that's three and a sixteenth for the sides and bottom, and four and a sixteenth for the top. At the chop saw, I use a stop block to make sure that the sides and the top and bottom pieces are cut to their respective lengths. And once everything's milled up, it's a good idea to lay out your parts and get a feel for how these half laps are gonna lay out. So I've got my sides here at the top and the bottom, and we'll do one top joint and one bottom joint just to explain what's happening. So here's my top left joint, and let's look at the half laps. The half lap's gonna take away half of the material on the underside of the side piece, somewhere like this. And then we're gonna remove this material from the top side of the top piece. Something like that. So when they nest together, the side piece just runs all the way through. Our bottom half lap is pretty much the same thing. The side is gonna travel all the way down and it's gonna overlap the bottom piece. I like to dummy proof the process by making pencil marks that indicate where my cuts will be. I then use a cutting gauge to slice the grain and firmly establish my shoulder lines. This cut line not only helps me with setting up the tools, but it ensures a tear out free cut. Now there are a lot of different ways that you can cut half laps, but one of my favorite is to use the table saw with the dado stack. So I've got my stack set to three quarters of an inch in width, and I'm just gonna use the miter gauge with the fence to sort of line everything up and batch out these cuts. So the blade is set to just under three eighths of an inch. We're gonna dial that in second. The first thing I wanna dial in is the fence position. And we'll start with our three inch uh, shoulder cuts here. So let's put the workpiece down and try to get everything lined up. I really just want to get that cut line lined up pretty close with the outer tooth of the dado stack. You can see how close we got, so I'm just going to nudge the fence until we are right on that cut line. That's about as good as it's going to get, so now I can remove the rest of this half lap and we can address the blade height to get the perfect fitting half lap. Now if we take our two test half laps and put them together on a nice flat surface, we could really see what's going on here. All right, there's a nice lip. Okay, so I definitely undercut it, that was intentional, and now we could just sneak up on the fit. Keep in mind though, we have to be extra careful about how high we raise that blade because the effect is times two, because we're gonna remove stock from this piece and from this piece, so be very, very uh, cautious with your adjustments. And after a couple rounds of adjustments, you should have something like this. Now mine are still just a little bit proud, you know, and I'm okay with that because I've ways to finesse the face of this joint. So, but boy, that is, that's darn close. All right, now we can cut the rest of the three inch half laps. So now we can adjust the fence for the four inch half lap. And for this one, we're gonna leave the blade exactly where it is in terms of height. It's already dialed in. All we need to do is move this fence. Well, now you want to examine all four of your joints and just make sure everything fits together the way you want it to, right? You should have a pretty gap-free joint up here. Uh, the underside is a little bit less important because you're not going to see it, but it should be nice and flush. Now, feel with your fingers. 
If you followed my instructions, you'll notice a little bit of a discrepancy here. This side piece sits proud. I feel a little bit of a lip here. And the same thing with the top piece. It's a little bit proud of this end grain. That is absolutely intentional. And the reason is when we clamp this together, you'll see this in a little bit, we need some pressure that's gonna bring it in and close up these two shoulder areas here. So a built-in way to do that is to leave a little bit of extra stock that we can plane away later. And that's gonna help us with clamping. All right, the other thing to look at is to make sure everything is nice and flush. If you find that the pieces are just a little bit proud of one another because there's a little too much material here, at this point, if it's a tiny amount, you're probably better off at the workbench than at the table saw. A surface like this right off of the dado blade can actually be a little bit rough. You're gonna have some high spots, some low spots. So just using a block plane, or in this case, I've got a rabbiting block plane where the blade goes all the way to the outside of the body. You can take a couple of passes and just sort of remove those high points. Right, now watch out toward the end. You don't wanna tear out, so you might kind of uh, give yourself a little bit of relief there, just in case. But try to take even passes across the surface. Now, if it takes anything more than just a couple of passes, you probably do wanna go back to the table saw. This is only for the purposes of finessing the fit. So a couple of passes, you can see we're nice and smooth now, and this should fit perfectly. Now, the next thing I wanna do is add a little design detail. This is something that's completely optional, so you don't have to do it if you don't like the way it looks, but I do like the way it looks. So what I'm gonna do is put a little chamfer on the inside edge. So when these two pieces meet, there's actually gonna be a slight gap created between there. Now, when we do the finishing later, and you see when we start to use a glaze, you'll see how that will actually help us. But you may not like it. You may just want a totally flush fit here, so ignore it if you don't like it. Uh, but let me show you how I do it with a block plane. So what I'll do is just put a light chamfer on this inside edge, and this is one of my side pieces here. And I'm basically just gonna count the strokes. If I keep that number consistent, I should have the same chamfer on all of my pieces. So that's about what I'm going for, just a nice light chamfer. And at this point, these are sort of sharp edges. I just wanna knock them down a little bit with some 220 paper and soften it up. Now our top and bottom pieces also need their inside edge done, but before we do that, we're gonna do the shoulder. The easiest way I know to do this is to just approach it from each side. If I go all the way, I'll definitely get some tear out there, so let's just try to avoid it. Even with a sharp blade, those end grain cuts can be a little bit rough. So I like to have a little stick. Basically, this is just a little piece of uh, MDF something or other schmutz that I have in my shop. And I put a little piece of sandpaper on it and it works as a little flat sanding implement like this that's perfect for small details. And I could use this to smooth everything out. Now, only after both of these ends are done will I go and do the long grain. If I do have any tear out, this should take care of it. So you might be wondering, why not just use a router to do an operation like this? Well, first of all, getting the end grain parts done, that's gonna be a little tricky with a router bit because the bit and the little screw that holds the bearing in place is gonna to wanna to make contact. So you don't have much room to play there. And if I'm gonna use my block plane to do that, I may as well just quickly get it done. And now I don't have to set up a router bit. And frankly, with one frame, it's just as easy and quick to do it with a block plane. Sometimes it's just fun to use hand tools and to incorporate them into your work when you can, when it makes sense. Uh, it's very gratifying and it puts a little extra love into the project. There's nothing wrong with that. All right, now for the fun part, we can do the assembly. This glue up is gonna take a little bit of strategy and some forethought. So we're gonna have four big clamps. I'm gonna use my parallel clamps, but there are other types of clamps. Pipe clamps would work for this too, to apply pressure from all directions to close everything up. But we also need pressure at each and every one of those half lap joints, kind of pinching it and sandwiching it together. So I'm gonna use three clamps per joint, and I've got all these little small clamps for that. And because we don't wanna dent the wood, and it's nice to have something to spread out the pressure, I've got a couple pieces of scrap cut that we'll use as calls to apply pressure. All right, and I'm gonna use a long set glue. Basically, it's a tight bond extend. Just gives me a little bit more working time for something like this. All right, let's get to it. Each joint gets a generous amount of glue. And look at how much long grain glue surface we have to work with. No wonder these joints are so strong. Now I'll add a little bit of pressure and then bring in the second set of clamps. If you look closely, you could see that the 16th of an inch overage ensures a nice tight shoulder. 
Now I'll loosen and retighten all the clamps just to make sure that everything is hitting home. At each corner, I'll drop in a call and add the small clamps. Now you might think that the joint is tight, but watch what happens when we apply pressure. That squeeze out tells us that we're making good contact. Of course, you'll want to check for square as always, but if your half lap shoulders are nice and square, there really shouldn't be much to worry about. After a few hours, I can remove the frame from the clamps. Now I've definitely got some cleanup to do on the frame, but before I do the fine stuff, I'm just going to start with the sanding block and remove any of the, the big offending glue squeeze out that might be dried on the surface. Well now let's talk about the curve on the top of the frame. Now if you're just making one of these, you're probably better off taking your measurements kind of like we did on the drawing and using your uh, bent piece of wood or drawing bow to make the curve right on the frame, cut it and then finesse it so it's nice and smooth. If it's a one-off project, that's all you need to do. But if you're building multiples like I am, I'm actually building two of these. And if you think you might be building one in the future, it's a good idea to get a template, finesse that template, and then use the template to transfer the marks to the other pieces. All right, so what I'm going to do is cut out of this actual drawing. Uh, we're going to cut this top piece out, and then I'll have a template to store in the shop for future use. I use the bandsaw to cut the rough curve and then use a block plane to work down to my line. Of course, a flexible sanding strip finishes it off nicely. So now with my template, I could just drop it on one of my frames here, make sure it's centered. You pretty much line it up by eye if it doesn't reach all the way to the ends. Now to cut the curve, I'm going to use the bandsaw, but because I've got a full-size frame here, it just gets a little unwieldy. So I've got two roller stands set up and a piece of plywood sitting on top of it. It's not, you know, super stable, but it's going to get the job done, just giving me a little bit of extra outfeed support so I could focus my attention on making sure I don't go over my line. So now I'm just going to attach the template to the workpiece with some double-sided tape. You might find it as a Turner's tape, but it's a nice pressure-sensitive, really sticky double-sided tape. And once the template is where you want it, put down the pressure. So I'm just going to flip this guy upside down, and we'll pinch it between the dogs here. Now my router is outfitted with a flush trim spiral bit. Now, I like the spiral action on this because the shear cut gives me a nice clean cut, even on this really figured wood. And I've got a little double bearing down here that's going to ride up against the template, and this should give me nice clean results. So anything the router wasn't able to get, I could just use my rasp to continue on. I just have this little piece at the end that needs to be done. And for the rest of it, I'll just use my flexible sanding strip. Now, of course, you remember, we left these parts a little bit extra wide to help us with the clamping. Well, now it's time to fix that. So it should just be a little bit proud of the end grain on both sides. So what we need to do is make some cleanup passes on both the sides and the bottom, just to make sure it's nice and flush. All right, so I've got my jack plane here set up, and I specifically have my 50 degree bevel. This is a bevel up plane, so if the bevel is a little bit more severe like that, it's actually going to be a little kinder to us on a figured wood like this. Uh, if you have a real low bevel angle, you might actually wind up with quite a bit of tear out, so you do need to be careful. Um, other things you could do, you could probably set your jointer for a really, really light pass, but you have to be careful because once you get to the end of the pass, you're going to hit the end grain of the other part of the half lap and you could snap that right out of there. That could be problematic, so if you do that, be very careful about it. But I think a hand plane is probably the safest bet here. Once you're able to get a nice clean shaving all the way across and you're even at both ends, you should be good to go. All right, I'll do the same treatment for the bottom and the other side. 
All right, that's looking pretty good. Now, I'm not quite ready to cut the rabbit because I like to do a little bit of preliminary sanding and plus my glass isn't here yet. So um, the sanding we're gonna do is just gonna smooth everything out. And if you think about it, we still have to do a routing operation. And whenever you run that router on the surface, you have a chance of denting or scratching the material. So if you sand it down to 320 grit at this point, and then you have a router operation to do, you might have to wind up sanding again later. So at this point, we'll do some preliminary sanding, but we won't go all the way to our final grit.